Okay. Now. So I'm going to start today by talking about our backyard trees, fruit trees, right for you. And give me a wave, Melissa, if I'm working right here. Can you hear me? Okay. So uh, I've been with Benton County for since 1998, and uh, Washington state law says that you have to require horticultural pests and diseases um, that you have to control them. Uh, my talk today is pretty much going to be on control of pests. Uh, at this point in time, uh, your fruit trees should be pruned if you have them. That uh, issue and the pest board both recommend that you prune the trees to keep them 10 foot tall or shorter so that you can reach the top of the tree. Uh, so, in our area, if you can, if you have apricots, nectarines, peaches, or plums, uh, normally you put a dormant spray on, which is an, an oil that you want to get thorough coverage of the tree because the oil actually physically smothers the overwintering insects on the tree. And then in most cases with these fruit trees, you're going to just monitor and see if you see a problem. And if you do, then you identify what it is, either calling the pest board me or your local extension office or the master gardeners. Apple and pear trees require a dormant spray. And then starting in mid-May, you're gonna have to spray every 10, 14 days, depending on the product you use to control cauling moth. And cauling moth is what puts the well, larvae in the fruit and ruins it. And I'll talk a little more later on in the slides. Cherry trees, you put a dart spray on, and then starting in at about Mother's Day, you're gonna just wanna spray once a week to control cherry fruit fly so that you can get clean fruit. So this is my slide to say this is what we don't want. Um, this is what happens in our area if you do not treat for calving moth. Um, calving moth is just, it's here, so it's something you have to worry about. So common problems, like I said, calving moth in apples and pears and western cherry fruit fly in cherries, and those insects just are here. I should say, if you have any questions, please send them in chat so that I can answer them. And at the end, I will have my email, phone number, and the extension uh, information. So if you have further questions, you can get answers. So the new invaders in our area are spotted wing drosophila and apple maggot. And for those that don't know spotted wing drosophila, it is like the little vinegar fly that you get in overripe fruit in your house. And the issue is that the female can actually pierce green fruit. And uh, so be before it's overripe, so you can actually end up with uh, fruit being infested early. Uh, just had a question of, can you feed uh, fruit that has been infested with calling moth to livestock? And I would say, yes, you could. Um, I Technically, it, it is rotting inside there. So depending on how much rot is going on inside that fruit, it may not be the best. Um, and that's part of the discussion later on is, you know, you want to clean up 
and and destroy that fruit. So, and then apple maggot is is not in our area. We this Washington State Department of Ag traps throughout the state for apple maggot, and in most years they do not find any in Benton County. Uh, last year they found one, and so we had to treat that tree. But in places where apple maggot is found, like Spokane County or on the other side of the mountains, on the on the west side of the mountains, it's something that is kind of like the cherry fruit fly that you have to treat uh, weekly to try and control. So for codling moth, it is a um, can attack crab apples, pears, quince, hawthorn, plum, and walnut. In Washington State, we don't have it in uh, plum or walnut. Uh, it's also rare that you find it in a hawthorn. It really, if there is a fruit tree available, uh, an apple or a pear, that's what it's going to go after instead of uh, the others. Uh, in walnut, it's listed because in California, they have an issue with it in walnuts. So uh, my slide says that 80 to 95% of the apple on the tree would be infested if it wasn't managed. Um, I think that's really wrong. It should probably say 100% because if you're not controlling it, it will wipe out your whole apple crop. Hey, Frank. So, yes. Uh, we did have a question come in about, um, do pheromone traps work for that instead of spraying? Um, I'm not sure. Okay. So, yeah. So f the pheromone traps work to monitor and let you know that you have a problem. You won't catch enough of the moths in the pheromone traps for it to be used as a control. And unfortunately, there's many websites that will tell you if you put up enough traps, you can control them. Uh, and there are people who use multiple traps in their apple trees or pear trees to reduce the population. Um, and they do have actually uh, lures now that uh, back when I started, the, the lure only attracted the male moths. And now they have lures that will attract female and male moths. But it's not. Uh, it's not considered a control method, but it would help if, if somebody wanted to do that. So on the slide here, it shows the, the moth that comes out and then the, the moth lays eggs and where we're targeting the, them is in this, in the lower right corner, you see the the egg and the, the hatch to the neonate. And that's what you're trying to put, get spray on the tree. So when that egg hatches and that neonate starts crawling around to look for an apple, it's going to ingest the pesticide. So the neonate bores into the apple and then comes out of the apple. And depending on what time of year it is, early in the season, it will turn into another moth and have a, a second. And in our area, we have a third generation in normally in September because it's warm enough. And then those that don't turn into that third generation will overwinter. And they overwinter on any little nook and cranny on your fences, on the tree and tree bark. Uh, with the, in the commercial orchards, they found them in between the layers of the plywood in the apple bins. So it doesn't take very much. And even when they switched to the plastic apple bins, they found that after a year or two, there's enough nicks on those plastic bins that for Kali moth to overwinter on those as well. So Here's talking about the mating disruption. So in a commercial orchard, they can put out enough pheromone dispensers to 
make it so the, the male moth can't find the female. And for the average person, you don't have enough trees. It takes a couple acres of dispensers to have enough pheromone plume that the male can't find the female. So when you just have an individual tree, it basically there's enough areas, just like in the, the picture here, there's enough areas where the pheromone isn't so the male can find the female and and it only takes one mated female would ruin your whole apple tree and and there's traps picture of the trap there so we put up the trap and like i said now you have uh, the da lure that attracts both males and females to give you an idea of what you have in our in your area in Washington State, codling moth is here, so you just have to deal with it. There's, you might plant a tree and get a year or two where you don't have codling moths show up, but they will show up. Some of the control methods, uh, one of them is the kale and clay, and uh, it's used in commercial orchards for sunburn control and as a it actually the the light layer of clay film on the fruit the female moth doesn't like that actually the male the codling moths do not like the texture and so they will avoid that if they can uh, but the problem with using kale and clay is that the fruit is expanding so quickly when it's small, uh, young, that it only takes a week or two, and then you have exposed parts of your fruit that aren't covered with kale and clay. And then insecticides, that's a picture of uh, something I hope you don't have to do. That's part of the reason why we talk about printing your trees down 10 feet so that you can get thorough coverage. Um, that's actually spraying a really big tree. So, uh, but it is important with any of these insecticides when you're spraying a fruit tree that you get thorough coverage of the tree. I've had many people that spray quote unquote what they can hit from the bottom and codling moth in particular and cherry fruit fly tend to fly to the top third of the tree to look for a mate. So if you have, if you're not spraying the whole tree, you're gonna be in trouble. So here's the recommendation for insecticide control for collie moth. Uh, the recommendation currently is spinosad, which is a, an organic insecticide. When you look for it in the store, there are products that are labeled organic and there's products that are not it actually is the carriers in with it that um, are not organic in most of them um, and actually they're part of it is like is there's actually a uh, sunscreen to protect it because uv rays is what breaks down the product drying out and and the sun's uv rays so there's the target is that little neonate, the newly hatched larvae. And so if you're going in, in our area, we have to, uh, we actually put out on my website and the, the extension website when it's time to spray, because we have a really accurate degree day model that predicts when calling moth will be out and they will start laying eggs. Um, the old timing was two weeks after full bloom in red delicious apples, which there's not many people growing red delicious apples anymore. Uh, so, and it says, you know, three to four covers per generation. And in our area, we normally do have that third generation. So you are spraying from May normally all the way through until you're removing your fruit. 
in the in the fall. And at the very end, I believe the website is on the the one of my slides here. So this is Western cherry fruit fly, and I'll I'll point out the big difference between codling moth control and western cherry fruit fly control is you're actually targeting the fly the adult fly instead of the larvae because the the female cherry fruit fly actually pierces the cherry and lays the egg inside the cherry and once that egg is inside the cherry it's nothing that you're going to spray is going to kill that cherry fruit fly larvae and so if we have a single generation in a year they overwinter in the soil underneath the tree uh, many people ask if they can spray the ground and if that will do anything and they've studied it and basically unless that those adult flies are actually emerging from the ground when you spray, you're just wasting that spray. So it's not an effective method. And it takes the cherry fruit fly female 10 days from when she comes out of the ground to become uh, sexually active to lay eggs. And so that's why we talk about spraying once a week and in theory, you should be controlling uh, all of the adult flies so there's never a chance for a pregnant female. So here's some of the traps. And once again, that, that red sphere there has the stickum on it. And there are many websites that will tell you that that is a control method for cherry fruit fly. And it can tell you that it will catch many, many flies but it will not catch enough for you to have clean fruit. The yellow sticky trap is what we use, and that mimics the straw color of the cherries in the early season. And so the cherry fruit flies basically think it's the world's largest cherry and fly into it. And uh, once again, spinosad is a product that we recommend for control of Western cherry fruit fly. Years ago, there was a, uh, a bait that you could spray on the tree with spinosad in it, and it was very effective. Uh, in our area now that we have the spotted wing drosophila, the more effective method is to spray, broadcast spray with spinosad. So you're killing the Western cherry fruit fly and any drosophila that might be in the tree. There we go. Okay, so there's a picture of spotted wing drosophila. It's actually really tiny. Uh, we use cider vinegar traps to identify where it's at. It actually works somewhat as a control method to reduce the amount that's that's in your orchard, but um, it also the problem with the spotted wing drosophila is it will attack any of the berry crops we have in our area and any of the fruit crops we have in our area. Uh, so uh, many people don't treat blackberries or raspberries. Uh, and so there can be a high population midsummer. That's why we recommend the broadleaf or the, the broadcast spraying to control it. Uh, the other thing you want to do is really important that disposing of any damaged fruit and when you're thinning trees once again so it used to be a method of you pick the fruit off the tree and just drop it on the ground and let it rot uh, now we tell you you need to take all that fruit you're thinning off of the trees and dispose of it um, and the other thing is to to make sure you're you're completely removing all of the fruit from the tree uh, at harvest time. Here's apple maggot. So the apple maggot is not in our area. We find one. The state finds them randomly, and 
It looks just like the cherry fruit fly, only it has different stripes on the wings. And we're lucky to not have it here. It is in the upper Yakima area and uh, in Ellensburg and in Spokane. So it is in the state. It's widespread on the west side of the state. And it is a quarantine pest that we don't want to get established here. So when the if the Washington State Department of Ag finds one, we work with the homeowner to get it controlled quickly. It's never been found in a commercial orchard. So here's my um, email, and I guess I don't have the website. If you if you go to uh, the co.benton.wa.us is Benton County's web page, and I am on there. You can click it. You can also go to the Benton Franklin WSU extension and uh, find me. So um, if there's any questions, I was kind of worried I was going to talk way too fast, and I did. Um, I told Melissa that talking without actually seeing people was going to be a little difficult here. So um, I'm used to having people talk to me so and ask questions as we go. Uh, Hi, Frank. Yeah, this is Matt here. Uh, we do have a question. Um, we asked, uh, can you share the link uh, to the website that you mentioned about a spray schedule? So it, it is on the on my web page, and I'll I'll show up that I have. Um, I'm not sure if I can switch and just have my camera, but I'm not sure exactly how to do this. Um, Frank, I can take back uh, basically, and I can take it back so I'm the presenter, and then it should just okay. be your camera. Well, or can I do, is that, no, that didn't work. Yeah, because I, I have to, a couple things to show. So the one is for codling moth control, you can actually do, use a bag instead of having to spray the fruit. And I have an example here. I don't know if it's showing up for people to see. Can you see that? So this is this is a bag that goes over the fruit and it actually has a little slit for the stem. And then there's a, a little wire in the bag. And you actually put this around the fruit and close it up at the top around the apple and it physically the female coddling moth can't get to it the neonates can't crawl to it because you're you've sealed the fruit off so it works really well uh, and then the bag is actually twofold this keeps sunlight off of it and then right before you harvest the fruit you actually peel the gray off and the inside has, there's a, a red film that you leave on and it turns the fruit red. And when we did experiments with this, uh, it worked wonderfully. It's worked in commercial orchards, but it is labor intensive. But when we figured it out, the amount of time you use to take to spray your fruit trees by thinning with and putting these on, you're using the same amount of time and then you don't have to spray for the rest of the year. So, uh, and then this is what we have paper spray charts. And this is also on the Benton County website. If you go to the Benton County Horticultural Pest and Disease Board. And there's one for backyard apple and pear tree pest management. And there's one for uh, soft fruit, which is the all the stone fruit, cherries, plums, apples, nectarines, uh, apricots. So uh, it has 
much more information on it about the other insects in our area. Um, normally, and I did say that you should have put a dormant spray on, and at this time of year, things are are growing, so it's um, there right now. There's going to be a lot of what we call delayed dormant going on, right? As those you start to see a little green in those buds. Um, so I'm trying to read the notes here. It says, do you recommend growing degree day schedule to figure out when to spray for calling moth? Yes, we do. And actually I put on um, the WSU has the decision aid system, which takes weather stations across the state of Washington and calculates when it's time to spray. And for Benton County, I have four sites that I monitor through that decision aid system. And when it's time to spray, I post on our web page that it's time to spray. And so normally I monitor uh, out in Finley, uh, a spot in Badger Canyon, a spot in Benton City, and then a spot up by a crosser. So I kind of get the obviously the, the Finley is the, the earliest and the up and prosser is the latest. So um, if if your tree I, there's a question about putting on the the dormant spray and uh, the question is whether you could still put dormant spray on. Yes, you could still put dormant spray on. Uh, like I said, most of it talks about as the um, you start to see a little green showing up. That's it's called a delayed dormant, and um, there's it it works well. You could also in in many cases uh, missing one year is not going to cause you a great bit of trouble. If you do have a problem with aphids one year or scale then you really want to make sure the next year that you get that spray put on. Um, there's, I don't know the cost of the bags. And right now, I think I, I haven't looked this year on the internet to find out where you, I could find them. Uh, in the past places, the, the bigger chemical companies in the Valley have had them for sale and some of the websites have had them for sale. Uh, and it, the question was, if you use the clay, do you also spray and use combo? Uh, to, in order to get clean fruit, the, you would have to use, you'd have to spray additionally. The, like I said, the problem with, with spraying with kaolin clay is when you look at that fruit, within a short period of time the fruit is expanding so quickly that there's places on the fruit that are not covered by the kale and clay and so there so that the fruit is technically exposed um, i would think that using clay and and also using the spinosa you might find to be an adequate method so the other thing is that that the clay is a little difficult because it is a texture issue as far as spraying. So it takes a little bit to figure out how to mix it up and put it through a sprayer. Um, and it's going to wear your parts because it is, once again, it's an abrasive material. So um, I haven't had anybody, honestly, as a backyard person, you use a kale and clay effectively. So, Frank, we did have another question that came in. It says, does dormant spray work for earwigs on apricot trees and when should I use it? So dormant spray doesn't work for earwig control. Um, earwigs are the bane of people with uh, apricots and there are um, a couple control methods, um, and actually, I'm, 
uh, uh, right now, Arboril, which is uh, commercially known as in S7, is one of the control methods. Um, and the, the other thing people do is wrap cardboard around the apricot the trunks and the, the bigger branches and the earwigs will go into it in the morning to get out of the sunlight. But then you have to go and remove those pieces of cardboard and dispose of the earwigs that are in it. So I'm not sure how great a method that works. Uh, the spraying with carbaryl talks about spraying on the trunks and crotches of the tree in early spring when the earwig attack activity is first observed. So, is there any more questions? Frank, we just got one that says, uh, would DE at the base of the tree keep off earwigs? Would what? Uh, DE. I'm not sure what that is. Diatomaceous earth. Diatomaceous earth. Mm, okay. I, I haven't known anybody that has used diatomaceous earth as an effective control for earwigs. So um, the question about shot hole bore and shot hole bore would be one that um, shot hole bore tends to go after uh, trees that are in decline and um, Oops, Kate, I think we're getting a little feedback from, there we go. Uh, I'm trying to look real quick. I don't have, a, I would tell you to email me if you've got shot hole bore. Um, and uh, we can discuss trying to control it. I don't have it right in front of me as one of my control methods. I would tell you that in most cases, the branches that the shot hole borer are going after are not healthy. It, it will, if you have a really high population, I have seen it once in my career, where an adjacent orchard was a complete nightmare and full of shot hole bore. And the shot hole bore was then attacking the healthy orchard on the edge because the numbers were just so huge. Question of if shot hole fungus related to shot hole bore. And I am not familiar with shot hole fungus. And so I can't answer that question, unfortunately. Uh, I would tell you if, so shot hole borer, if you look at a tree and it, it actually looks like somebody blasted it with a shotgun, there is a bunch of little pinholes in it. That's where the shot hole borer has gone in. And it might be an issue. Uh, that you you end up with fungus related to that or damage because there there are open wounds in that tree. Um, and I just say the note again about diatomaceous earth at the base of trees for control of earwigs. And like I said, I have not known of anybody who's done that um, and had control. So I don't know for sure. I would say that it's not listed as a control method. Um, so it might be something to try. Um, it does work for ant control, I can tell you that. It, but um, I, I don't have a, a full answer for that. So um, there's a question of how you identify an, an apple tree. And I would say if you're trying to figure out what the variety of the apple tree is, in most cases, you need to have the, 
the right fruit. Um, there are some people that can identify a tree a little bit without having fruit, but I've been doing this since 1998, and I can tell you that um, I can identify apple tree versus other fruit trees, but I certainly can't tell you the variety without seeing what the fruit is that's growing on the tree. Um, there's questions about um, combating fire blight in a pear tree, and uh, fire blight is one of those issues that uh, you have to prune when it comes out, and you the <clears throat> method is normally to go back from where you see the fire blight and, and cut. And the people that I know who've been effective at doing it, uh, years ago, Tim Smith in Wenatchee used to say you go towards the trunk from where you see the fire blight and where you think it's good. And then you go an additional distance where it really hurts because you're taking a chunk of that tree off if you're trying to keep it from spreading into that tree. In our area, the problem we have with fire blight is all of the host material. Uh, fire blight is kind of like cotton moth in that it is just in our area. And there are some years that we have much worse conditions. And it's a matter of moisture, temperature, and the fire blight being in the area. So part of it's having a healthy tree, but not too vigorous of a tree. Um, and at this point in time, there really are no uh, effective products for homeowners to use to control fire blight. So, I see um, Ramona asked or said that shot hole is cranium blight. So there is cranium blight is um, copper products. They're what you use to control uh, the cranium blight. Uh, you want air movement um, through the tree and uh, the copper is put on as a, uh, a dormant, a delayed dormant application. Uh, I should say with all of your fruit trees, one of the biggest issues I have seen in the Tri-Cities is that your sprinklers should not hit the fruit trees. Yeah, if you're spraying an insecticide in the tree and then your sprinklers hit it, you're washing the insecticide off of the tree. As far as things like fire blight and the other diseases, you're adding moisture to the, the canopy and that's bad. So uh, you, you need to make sure your sprinklers aren't hitting them. We had a, I had a grower, backyard person years ago that had a rainbird sprinkler that was attached to a fence. So the sprinkler was sitting at six foot high and it was completely washing down the cherry tree. Uh, and they were running the sprinklers about every other day for the lawn. So it was washing that cherry tree every other day. So. Are there any other questions? If you go to Benton County's, the extension webpage, there are many uh, handouts on uh, information on uh, nutrients for a tree, um, proper pruning is there. Um, question of whether almond trees do well in the area. I know they grow some almonds uh, up the valley. I haven't actually talked to anybody who's, an almond, who's grown an almond tree, so I'm not sure how well they would do. Um, it's I, I've seen them grown. Um, 
I know even there's at least one person in our area that's been growing pecans, uh, which should not grow very well in our area. Um, but there's also a lot of people that it's a labor of love and they, they grow certain varieties because they really, really want it. And it may not do so great, but they're willing to put the effort in. So, are there any other questions? Uh, question of can you prune now? Yes, you can still prune. Um, and actually, there's, uh, you, in theory, you can prune any time of year, uh, depending on how big the tree is. I tell people, especially now, if, if it's a huge tree, you need to get in there and, and get it controlled because most people, the, when the tree is a huge shade tree, it doesn't work very well for a fruit tree. So, um, and there's another question, is there a variety of apple that does well in hot climate? Uh, I'm not sure what your hot climate is. I would tell you there's, uh, many people think that we have a hot climate here. Uh, there are some that, do well. I'm not sure which exact varieties. Uh, and one of the issues you have to look at is uh, your chilling hours in the wintertime if it gets cool enough. Uh, question of do extension agents make home visits? No, they do not make home visits. So uh, you can uh, contact me or the master gardeners or the extension agent and and ask questions and and bounce ideas off of them but um, I do as part of the pest board I do go out and take a look at fruit trees and try and identify if somebody has a uh, a pest or a disease problem uh, what they have and they can take samples and bring them back and and WSU has a, a lab that we can test depending on what the issue is um, uh, there's sometimes it's just a matter of uh, your growing practices that that it's not necessarily a problem like I said somebody that has a sprinkler that's uh, spraying down a tree on a daily basis. Um, years ago, one of the extension agents told me the biggest problem, one of the biggest problems for a backyard person is trying to grow a lawn underneath the fruit tree. And so you're watering and fertilizing to, to have a green lawn instead of managing the water and the nutrients for those fruit trees. And some of the best fruit trees I've seen in a backyard setting is where an individual truly has taken a portion of a yard like, and turned it into an orchard where they're managing the water and the nutrients solely for the fruit trees that are there. I don't know of anybody that's growing figs in our area, so I can't answer that question. I'm sorry about that one. There are, except once again, if you look at some of the websites, there are many different fruit trees that people, depending on where you're located and when your last frost is in the springtime, that you might be able to, to grow some different fruit. There's, um, I know at least one person in the Tri-Cities that has a lemon tree that is in a big pot and they pull it out during the uh, summertime and sunlight and they wheel it into a garage during the wintertime uh, to keep it from uh, getting blasted with too cold weather. So, um, but I can't answer fig tree, sorry.
And I, so Stephanie says she has a fig tree that she was moving in and out. She planted it. It's got, um, so she'll see if it comes back. There are um, many different web pages that talk about watering for fruit trees. Um, I'm not exactly sure um, of one off the top of my head. So. Uh, I hope that answers that question. So, and Tia says that she or her fig tree survived the winter outside. It was wrapped in burlap and packed with leaves. So, like I said, there's there's things you can do to keep them. Um, I've seen people put the little mini greenhouses over trees. Um, I can tell you out in Benton City, they had palm trees that didn't live, and they tried wrapping them and putting heat lamps underneath the wrap. All right. Well, I think um, we have time for maybe just one more question. But if we if we happen to miss your question, we are we are keeping track. Um, GoToMeeting records these for us. Um, but Frank, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. That was a great presentation, um, and thanks for mentioning about. The yard sprinklers. Um, I think that's really important for our backyard and, and small farm folks. Um, okay. And so I believe Matt posted your email in the chat box, um, but we can provide that information later as well. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Frank. Thank you.